What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast, bringing you some zesty, ideological ingredients so you can brew your own faith. Mm-hmm. And today on the podcast is a professor from Duke University, uh, Norman Wurz, by talking about his brand new book, The Way of Love. And, who, and who's against love? Look, you shouldn't have told me. Now I'm judging you. But... Uh, the listeners don't know who it was that said I am. Now, uh, they, they can support love all they want. And that's what we're talking about today. The way of love, the biblical Christian narrative and story and all such of goodness it gets unpacked. But first, I just want to tell you uh, that, that I just want to say thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I love nerding out each week, getting to interview some amazing people have conversations with them and share it with you and hear back from you and talk to all the uh, deacons, the audience out there that uh, I just, just wanted to say thank you. Um, in the next couple weeks, some crazy stuff is going to be happening at Homebrewed. I got some amazing interviews I've recorded. Some I recorded live when I was in North Carolina. Some amazing interviews I got that are all getting edited up right now, but also have a live event May 3rd if you're in Los Angeles, then you can uh, come on out to Malibu um, for for a little live podcast battle. Mm-hmm. The Homebrewed Christianity Podcast is going to have a podcast battle with the 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 Luke, the Luke, the Luke. I don't even remember his podcast. Oh, Luke, I forgot your podcast. I thought the title would have been a little more newsworthy. Especially since your last name is Norsworthy. Luke, what was the title? To Anyway, Luke Norsworthy has a podcast whose title I can't even remember. It's not even newsworthy. Um, and we're going to have a podcast battle uh, on, a, on a secret location in Malibu, like a rooftop. And, and it's not just us that are going to be there. We're also going to have some friends. Yeah. Um, uh, N.T. Wright's going to be there. Yep. Greg Boyd is going to be there. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Richard Beck is going to be there. The experimental theology blog come to life, and we're all there because we're going to talk about some demons. There's going to be other guests, other special activities, other things. I'm not even telling you right now because I can't even remember Luke Norsworthy's podcast, but he's going to go down in the battle. I haven't quite figured out how we're going to do the battle yet, but if you have ideas, let us know. Let us know on the Twitter or the Facebook. Or, you know, you can always call the uh, Homebrewed Christianity speak pipe and let me know what's up. Anyway, May 3rd, you can go to the Homebrewed Christianity website, get tickets to come on out. You'll get a, a pint glass and stuff to stick in it. You'll get to be present for a battle. Um, yeah, who doesn't want to do that? So, uh, as you're considering that spectacular feat in Malibu, uh, <clears throat> know that in the summer, I'm going to be going up to Vancouver Vancouver School of Theology to do a little uh, processy class in July. I'm also going to be at the Wild Goose Festival. And if you're a deacon that's going to the goose, make sure you let me know. We're going to have a little homebrewed camping area. And I got goodies and surprises for all y'all coming out. We're going to do a homebrewed Christianity a happy hour at the goose. And I'll be doing some uh, a happy hour uh, times. Uh, we're going to do a live podcast that will blow up the internet when it arrives. And um, we're going to camp, have some fun uh, in North Carolina at the Goose, then in Vancouver. Um, and I, I, I've been told there are deacons that can make it to Vancouver. I even know that like, deacon extraordinaire Ken Alton is going to be there. He just messaged me. He said, oh, I can get to Vancouver. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm looking forward to that. If you are going to be at the Goose, you're going to be in Vancouver, um, then make sure, you, make sure you let me know so we can uh, hang out, connect and such. Head over to homebrewedchristianity.com. You'll find the notes for this episode, link to the books and stuff that get talked about, and you'll find uh, info on joining the Homebrewed Christianity community. That is the group, the elect, the wonder working support system that keeps the podcast alive. You can uh, you donate every month. You're part of our secret Facebook group. You get invited to all sorts of things like the deacons meeting. What's the deacons meeting, you might ask? The deacons meeting is an interactive um, a faucet of theological uh, liquid 
It is um, a, a live streamed video interactive in a classroom with me, Tony Jones, talking with three different theologians over a couple hours. We do little mini interviews. They answer your questions. And if you're a member of the community, you'll get all three of the guests and topics sent to you. So you can uh, send in questions. You can join live. Ask them then on video. And then you'll get it all edited and delivered up to you in your mailbox as members. If you're interested in joining the Homebrewed Christianity community, go to homebrewedcommunity.com. And uh, if you're interested in attending a deacon meeting and aren't a member yet, then uh, just watch the website. We'll post it up. And uh, people that want to uh, check it out can. Now, we're going to talk to Norman about love. Here it comes. Ours is a time of social and spiritual upheaval and a desperate need of a path toward healing and reconciliation. The Drew Theological School can set you on this path. The Drew Theological School trains leaders, scholars, activists, and pastors to be rooted in Christian tradition, innovative in spiritual reflection, and courageous in pursuing justice. Through studies in one of the six degree programs offered at the Drew Theological School, you will become the rooted, innovative, and courageous agent of healing and reconciliation our world so desperately needs. To apply for one of the six degree programs at the Drew Theological School, visit their website at www.drew.edu forward slash theological or contact their admissions office at 973-408-3111. Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and I'm with not Norman Weirdbutt, but Norman Weirsba. Yeah, apparently um, when you have a name like that, kids could get too excited, but you don't get excited and don't drive off the road. But we're going to be talking about The Way of Love, and this book is a, an attempt to, to rediscover what, what should be the heart of Christianity, and uh, you, you might be surprised, it's love. So, uh, Norman, thank you for joining the podcast today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Oh, I, I, glad to do it. Um, uh, it, you know, I, it's a really opportunity for me to grow past, uh, the, the kind of, um, binary I draw between all North Carolina learning, uh, learning institutions and Duke. Um, you're the, uh, the other. Well, I think of myself as a missionary to you then. Ah, praise the Lord. Um, it, the, <laughs> the Methodists will really appreciate taking this tactic. And, so now we got to figure out if at the end of the show you've converted and you now want to come to Duke Divinity. Well, I, if if uh you, you you want to do your your fourth graduate degree, I guess uh, we'll try to work that out, or we can just hang out when I come. That'd be yeah, good. that'd be good. That'd um, be all right. So so uh, at at Duke, um, in in a number of your previous works have focused on ecology and food and the land and this type of stuff. Um, can you can you describe how a theologian ever gets in that that interested in that? Because I, unless you are a theologian and know that there are whole sections that are guild, where you sit around and talk about ecology and religion and things, it's not immediately obvious. Because because uh, you probably believe global warming was real, and yeah, and I know I'm a freak that way. Oh yeah, well, but, uh, you know I think part of it is is that so much of Christianity these days is gnostic. It only cares about the soul, and so. As a result, you just forget about whole stretches of human life, like our embodiment. Mm -hmm. The minute you talk about embodiment, you have to talk about food, you have to talk about land, you have to talk about energy, water, air, all of these things, because without them, you can't live. And so it's always been a bit of a puzzle to me that when you look at so many of the theological works that are being written and you read their table of contents, you look at the index, and you even read anthropologies and there's nothing about food. There's nothing about land. And I'm thinking, where do these people live? How do they survive, right? These are, these are really fundamental questions. And when you look at Scripture, of course, land and food is everywhere. And so the fact that it's not everywhere in our theology means there's something a little bit off. Mm -hmm. And, and w when was it that that became a academic passion that was part of your faith. Like yeah. it, most people have a hard time understanding Christians becoming theologians. Right. Um, and one of the things that I, I've always found is that there's always that first passion topic question that plagues a scholar so much. They're like, yeah. you know what I want? Student loans to figure this one out. Right. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is my own experience. I grew up farming in Southern Alberta and thought I was going to be a farmer and I, I loved that life. But when I got older, I discovered that that's not economically viable. It's a really tough place to be if you want to make a living. And this was especially so in the eighties, right when I was going to school. And so I went to school, did philosophy and, and religion and uh, thought I had left food and agriculture behind. But that all changed when I met Wendell Berry, mm -hmm. when I started teaching in Kentucky. And uh, he helped me see how land and food issues are actually central to the way human beings think about cultural issues much more broadly. And so I started using the philosophical training that I had and the theological training I had to try to figure out what we can learn from agriculture and food production, but also how philosophy and theology can help us think about realities like food and land. Mm -hmm. in, in what has been like uh, the differences you've seen as a theologian, both addressing these issues in Canada, uh, all the way at different stops along the road to uh, Tobacco Road in uh, Durham. Have you seen differences in way different parts of the church in different areas relate to their, yeah, their I land? I think so. I mean, part of it is a feature of how different places in the country and in Canada will have more or less vibrant food and agricultural scenes. So where I am here in central North Carolina, there's a lot of stuff happening in local sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, farm to fork, you know, farm to restaurant kinds of, of enterprises. But that's not the case everywhere, right? Nashville's got a big scene going on. I don't know too much about what's happening in LA, but uh, there are some places where agriculture is just the industrial or conventional model and there just isn't much happening in the way of organic production or local food economies. So it really does depend on where you are in the country. Mm -hmm. Well, in one of the things that in, in your book, uh, the way of love it, that you notice as you're reading it is that uh, in one sense, it's a kind of back to the earthiness of the gospel telling um, and the contrast that get highlighted or the things that many Christians may go like, where's he going with this? Why is that there has a lot to do with this kind of the popularizing of a contemporary Gnostic Christianity. And uh, in, in a sense, you could read the book and the way you tell the Christian narrative and go, oh, this is this is revolutionary. This has a lot of critique for the kind of Western church. Uh, you could read it that way, but you could also read it as. Wow, this is this is way too conservative of a telling. It's really making all of our kind of Gnostic Christianity that's popular in the church uncomfortable. It's making yeah. us notice bodies and tables and foods and humans and our relationships to things past just our own individual relationship to God and our right. activity of sin management and whatever way we do that. Yeah. That like that sense of uh, when you do this kind of retelling of the heart of Christianity connected to love, you don't mean love in the kind of flippant or shallow or individualistic or just yeah. me and Jesus piety sense. It's like yeah. describe the earthiness of the word love that you're that you're wanting to unpack. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question because. When writing about love, the, the big temptation is to go sentimental pretty fast or romantic, if you want to use that term. And, and I wanted to make very clear that love is hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. And so uh, I also wanted to communicate how love touches everything. And it really starts with my understanding that the act of creation is itself an act of love. And that's something that we have to talk a lot more about in the church. Because I think that so many people in the church think that love is an emotion. And love is not primarily an emotion. Mm -hmm. Love is first and foremost an action. It's a power. And it's the power of God at work in the world. And so what you really need to do is figure out how does that power get expressed in the way we think about God's relationship and care for non-human creatures? How does that get expressed in the way God cares for human communities? How it's at work in our individual and collective bodies, right? When you take love and take it out of the realm of just sort of emotivism and you see how it's a, it's a power at work in the world, what I think that does is it opens up whole new ways 
for thinking about our relationships to each other, to the places in which we live. It gives you a new insight into the kinds of degradation we're doing and why they are so deeply, deeply destructive, but also uh, something that causes God to just mourn. Because when we destroy bodies, when we destroy lands, it's an affront to God's love. Mm-hmm. It will in in early in the book when you're connecting love and under its understanding in relationship to creation. One of the things I thought is helpful about that, it, coming at it from the other way, the way theologians normally discuss creation, is right. creation is a topic that gets argued about um, for odd reasons theologically. Yeah. Like so, the argument around creation out of nothing is the creation of nothing is a, a doctrine the church kind of makes um, more central uh, in the in the third and fourth centuries. Uh, yeah. The first person to be one was a Gnostic, oddly enough, um, and then it gets reappropriated uh, to be an anti-Gnostic doctrine, and that's one uh, kind of conversation partner around creation. Then you have kind of the eco-feminist critique that recognizes the Hebrew text. If you just read them rather straightforward, like uh, most Jewish people do, the yeah. idea of a uh, nothing that God created in is not what's there. It's about this relationship of right. of God and the Tehom and the depths and this type of thing. And so this creation out of this chaos or deep is a conversation. Um, and, it then the creation of nothing is is a doctrine you critique as an uh, in this kind of eco feminist type vein on behalf of a perverse notion of power, where um, as opposed to how you it gets reframed uh, in, in your text as creation is a statement about God's loving freedom, right. Not God's well, I power. Think that there's, I think there's huge confusion about creation out of nothing, and I try to address it briefly, because when people use the critique of creation ex nihilo as God imposing power mm-hmm. upon the world, I mean, whole books have been written about this, and it's a, a fundamental theological mistake, right? Because that's precisely what creation ex nihilo is designed to sort of undermine. When you talk about God creating ex nihilo, what you're saying is that God does not create out of any compulsion. God only creates out of love. And because it's ex nihilo, the nothing is not something, right? These people are all assuming the nothing is something, which it isn't, right? The creation ex nihilo is a way of saying that God and creatures exist in a non-competitive relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. Because the reality of God is different than the reality of creatures. And this has huge practical implications, which I would think eco-feminists would want to embrace, because what it means is that for human beings or creatures to thrive and flourish is not in any way a diminishment of God. In fact, God is glorified insofar as creatures flourish. Mm -hmm. So creation ex nihilo then becomes a teaching which is really about the empowerment of the world, because the more creatures live into the fullness of their lives, the more God is glorified. And that's a supremely good thing, because it actually becomes a way of subverting the kinds of powers in the world that degrade creaturely life. Well, and because, as opposed to creation, I'm nothing being described as a doctrine around uh, God's power, but around God's love, recognizing that both yeah. uh, the existence of the world comes out of God's love, but also the ongoing co-creative process is an expression of God's love for, with, and to the world. Um, and the other big thing in this is that Creation ex nihilo, as creation ex amore, as I say, yeah. that's a profound statement of God's intimacy and presence to the world. Because another thing that, that you get in the sort of standard critique of creation ex nihilo is that it gives you a distant God, right? So transcendent, mostly mad, and therefore unrelatable to. And that's precisely the wrong conclusion to draw from creation ex nihilo. Because if God creates out of love, What that means is that every creature is God's love made material. And it only survives because God is intimately present to it as the power of love and life at work within it. That's a huge, huge thing to be able to conclude. 
because it changes not only the way we think about God, it changes the way we think about what creatures are, how we should treat bodies. Bodies matter so much because it's God's love at work in them. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things uh, we, I guess it was three or four years ago in the open and relational theology group at AAR, um, we had a whole session on arguing around nothing, uh, creation out of nothing, creation out of love, uh, yeah. in, all, in the whole gamut. And one of the things I noticed, uh, and in, in, in this section made me think of it is, so you have like seven theologians who all really think they're positions important and clear and uh they're all my superiors and i agree with each of them uh, but uh when you have an account of creation out of nothing or this i don't want to take a stance but i'll just say love and bring the open relational multmanians friendly with the process types and stuff uh to an argument against it what they all agreed on in their different ways of retelling or interpreting the text is that creation is an act of love creating the conditions for the freedom which then brings about more generative love and create uh, creation and so the, right. the whole creatio ex amore thing i thought ah this is like the perfect compromise because everything y'all are all wanting to get out of it it yeah. says and then says Maybe the debate you're currently having isn't nearly as important, that you're fighting over different ways of rejecting a God who you envision as one who loves power more than love shaping right. the nature of power. Yeah. And yeah. like to me, I, 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 I see those conversations in theology as like, you know, you have like your normal kind of theological rules and the way you do stuff, but then underneath it, which is what I think you're getting at in the book is like, no, the way you tell the story is connected to an actual different way of being in the world. And the right. critique that you're putting towards Christianity is like, we have to learn to tell the story in this, with this depth and dirtiness in it, because yeah. without it, we have a really boring story. We have a flippant, shallow definition of love. And then you live in a kind of uninspired, uh, unengaged yeah. uh, faith, which is just ready to to escape the world rather than embrace it. Um, well, and it would be okay if it was just about escape. I mean, that's problematic enough. But what it ends up doing is it creates a Christianity in which it all becomes about power. Mm -hmm. And then you get Christianity that does these horrific things in the name of God. And one of the things I really want readers of this book to grasp is that Christianity, if it's to survive at all, better be about teaching us how to love each other, how to love the world, and how to love God. And if it doesn't do that, it should just go to the rubbish heap. Mm -hmm. Because without love, Christianity becomes really dangerous. And, uh, and throughout the book, you include a number of different uh, stories. And, uh, and you know, it, it, what I find helpful in pairing both this retelling of a biblical story as a po and like actual stories of human beings attempting to embody the way of love is it refuses to let either side off the hook. There's a temptation for Christians to just theologize about whatever they were going to do anyway. Um, uh, you know, real works of love or fidelity to idols and you never reflect right. upon it. And there's also a temptation to have this wonderfully clear ideas that evoke a response uh, conceptually, but never get embodied. And the right. hooking of the story of God with the story of God's people uh, through the text, I think they mutually connect to each other. But I like, what were you hoping to do in having um, yeah. human narratives well, that, yeah. and God's narrative running parallel in a sense? Yeah. I mean, that that's good. That's really important because it's really relatively straightforwardly easy to say what the story is but you have to be able to show what the story says not just tell it and you have to then be able to use narratives of what people have actually tried to do partly because it makes the ideas come alive or the concepts come alive but also it's because when you when you look at how people have tried to realize what christianity instructs us to think and feel and do then you can analyze the difficulty of what's involved, right? So when you think about, you know, one of the stories I, I tell in the book is about Maggie, right? This woman in Africa. And 
the experience that she has is just excruciating because she's dealing with Hutu and Tutsi violence and and she witnesses the slaughter of children and parents and it's just horrifying, right? And then you ask, well, what does Christianity have to do with that? And so as you can follow Maggie as she tries to live out a Christian witness in the context of utter brutality, and you see her success, but also her struggle and her failure, and then again success, and how often children come along and inspire her to keep going, that I think puts some real flesh on the bones that you need, because we've got lots of people maybe who are talking about love, but we need people who are actually trying to do it so that we can learn from them, how we can be inspired from them and learn from them in lots of ways, right? Learn from them in the sense that we can figure out that, wow, I didn't know we could do that, but also learning from them and saying, we don't want to do that because looking at Maggie, we see that's a dead end or Mm -hmm. it takes us to a place that we don't want to go. Yeah. Well, in the way that you structure the kind of fourfold telling of the story, you move from creation to the fall, and and I'm interested in why fall, not sin. Um, like, th- like, what are you doing in making that second move be the fall story kind of expanded and deepened? Um, uh, where is the uh, like, what's the version of that story that you, gets told that you go, oh, my theological allergies are just making me need Benadryl or I don't know. Um, like, yeah. w- what was being provoked and r- going right there next? Well, I think part of it is that there's a, a narrative logic that's important because when you announce that creation represents something like love becoming flesh, you don't take very long to figure out that there's a lot of bad stuff happening in the world, right? The flesh in which love is operative is wounded in so many ways. And so any kind of Christianity that does not talk about the wounding of love and the wounding of bodies, or that doesn't talk about how love can be the thing we most want to hate and kill, I think that's naive Christianity. So you got to be able to talk about, about sin and really, really, tough and realistic ways because that's our world Mm -hmm. uh that's just the way things are but then at the same time you have to be able to acknowledge that christianity has talked profoundly about the lovelessness and the hate that's in our world and so yeah what i wanted to do though is when you ask you know what am i reacting against well there are plenty of people who say the world has fallen so let it go to hell that's a huge mistake Because even though the world is wounded, bodies are being assaulted, the thing is that God never gives up on bodies, never stops loving the world. And if you go that route, you end up following Socrates, not Jesus. Yeah. And this is the thing that's really important to communicate. I think so many Christians want to be Socrates. They want to say, yeah, bodies are places of hell and suffering. So let's get away from them. We can't wait to be released from them so we can go to heaven in our souls, right? And this this is profoundly mistaken because if Jesus shows us anything, it's that he doesn't take flight from pain and suffering. Instead, he enters into it so as to heal it. Mm-hmm. And I, that's a much profounder uh, description of where we are as people. But to talk that way means you have to come with a whole bunch of honesty to a description about how our world is a place of wounds. Mm-hmm. So when a lot of people think of the fall story in, in scare quotes, I guess, uh, sure. uh, the kind of questions that people get hung up on uh, sometimes have to do with uh, how uh, – uh, reproduction works with these bodies to pass on original sin, or was this yeah, yeah. fruit an apple? Um, all sorts of things that you, you know just makes you pull your hair out uh, right. because you're like, oh no, Augustine had better questions for you to ask here than this. So, uh, but on the other side, there are Christians who, because the conversation has had this uh, kind of shallow, and then using the doctrine as a way of denying and oppressing people's flesh rather than creating right. honest situations for redemption, which is what you end up doing in the book. We we have churches that kind of just avoid talking about the 
sin or fall, or let's make it just social things and not talk about it as a way it oppresses you with either guilt or shame and these types of things. Right. Like, what is the the kind of thoughts you would like the reader come into mind when they get done and their kids like, oh, well, it's the fall story. You're like, well, yeah, well, I think the fall story can be spoken about in a much more interesting and helpful way. Once you recognize that sin is a distortion of love. Okay. That sin isn't simply something going really crazy and therefore we were passive and we weren't prepared. And so now we're all screwed together, right? It's not that. It's how we're screwing ourselves. Yeah. I mean, this is when if you describe sin as a perversion of love or as a power that works against love in the world, then you have, I think, the, the fresh opportunity uh, to see how, how deep this distortion can go in, our, in ourselves, in our communities, in our world. But also then you can begin to do some of the work that you know, Paul does say in Romans when he talks about the power of love to overcome even the most profound distortions that we bring to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that makes the gospel something that is much more illuminating to help us understand where things go wrong, but also more inspiring to help us figure out how we might be put on a better path. Yeah, and in, in the book, you one of the themes running through it is is not just kind of like the biblical story or the testimonial type stories that you get, but also it's turning towards the reader and the church to reflect on how it is forming disciples in the way of love. And in the fall section, you talk about being formed in sin. Uh, And can you say a bit about that? Because I think that section creates the context for hearing the redemption thing in a real joyful life affirming way. Because I, 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 for me, I think the enlightenment gave us this vision of rational free agents called human beings that has just ruined Christian theology because the, the answer to, uh, bad decisions is to help someone get the right information and they'll reflect right. upon it. Yeah, and we know that's been a disaster, right? We've got more information than we've ever had about everything, and it's not doing a whole lot to help us live better. No, right? no. So like, I think yeah, you're, right. you're right to talk about formation. That's really the crucial thing. And so rather than talking about something like a biological inheritance of sin, I want to talk instead about how how we are sort of shaped in worlds where love is presented to us in ways that are bound to be distorting. So if you think just about the lives of children, how many of them grow up in homes where, heaven forbid, they're being abused sexually or physically or even verbally, you know, being told that they're nothing or that they're just objects. But think about children who grow up in homes where they know that the love they experience is always conditional upon them doing X, Y, or Z, right? Having good grades, you know, looking a certain way, performing in a sport a particular way. If you don't do those things, you don't get love. Well, that shapes the imaginations that these kids are going to have about what love is about. And Christianity says, that's wrong, wrong, wrong. Love is not conditional in this sort of way. Or, when you get more serious, I mean, think about people who, who grow up in environments where there's warfare or where there's gang violence all the time or where pornography is prevalent, right? These are people who are being taught that bodies just don't matter or they're being taught that their lives don't matter. And so they have no desire to try to achieve, to try to love because they think it's all just a big joke. And uh, it's just a cosmic accident even. And so what I want people to understand is that we have to attend to the formation of people because love is not something that is determined by what you've heard or read in a book. It's about what's happening in the course of your day-to-day life. And if the church is going to try to help people learn to love, they really got to attend to these daily habits of formation. Because you can't just preach on a Sunday morning to somebody and say, yeah, you've got to love everybody. But you don't have an, or rather when you haven't taken the time to first understand how the, the, the kinds of imaginations that have shaped them to love in distorting kinds of ways 
are not even understood by them, right? So there's just a, a lot of levels of work that have to happen, which is why I say churches are at their best when they're a kind of school where we come together to figure out the difficulty of love, how the love we have sort of inherited has been distorted and degraded, and then try to figure out ways to help us imagine and then realize love better. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a uh, a friend that does um, church, like blind church visits and reviews, you know, for yeah. ministers will have her come visit the church and you know, like help them do assessments of what happens with no one there knows you and they show right. up. Uh, and I was talking to her. I'm like, that's, you know, if you work at churches, you go to the same church all the time. And the ones you know are the ones that are either mad at you the most or just celebrate everything you do. Um, yeah. Especially in bigger churches, you have a hard time even knowing everyone in your congregation. Right. Um, and the way you think about your congregation that you're you're serving, um, it, unless you work real hard, is just not going to be something that attends to the initial experience of you know visitors and this type of thing. Um, uh, unless it's putting them in some siphon to make them end up, you know, joining something that will not change when they become members, but they get the perks. And, yeah. and, and so I was like, so how do you, 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 what kind of church do you go to? Oh, I go to, you know, from Catholic churches to Pentecostal ones, to mainline Protestant ones, everything in between. And I was, so like, like how long does it take you to figure out like what kind of input you're going to give? And she was like, Oh, buy it. before the preacher ever preaches, you can already know how, like how it's going to go. And, She's like, you know, you know, the line in the scriptures where it says, you'll know they're Christians by their love. You can figure that out in the first 20 minutes pretty easy. And yeah. I'm like, so where do you see the kind of loving churches? And she's like, honestly, I was hoping you were going to explain it. I think it's kind of completely unrelated to whatever they believe uh, or what tradition they're in or the music or the number of people or the wealth or the, any yeah. of these things. Like, uh, I feel like Christianity is identified when the uh, character and integrity of their relations is something you're being invited into in a non-threatening or anxious type of way where you're, yeah. you're like, we love you. Thank you for being here. We'd like to meet you. And you pick up on that and you could love everything or hate what the minister's saying, but it doesn't change the way I end up experiencing the congregation. And yeah. I, I thought of that uh, in, in that section because what if the... It, the kind of emphasis on churches and in your family of faith in these places being communities of formation, um, that really turns us away from fixing all of our ideas um, and attending more to the way in which the, the process of living life together. Uh, yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that our, we should have shallow definitions of love and not think about it, but it does kind of insist that there is a... Uh, more flesh on an idea than uh, uh, than a Platonist is willing to allow. Yeah, no, I think that's good. I think uh, one of the ways that churches sometimes miss out on what you're talking about is they tend to focus on things like the liturgy, right? Do they have a really nice building? Do they have really sweet programming that they can offer to all age groups and all sorts of demographic interests? And that's not to knock those things. I mean, they're, they're important things to do. But what they'll miss is what you're talking about, which is a community which is really concerned and has it as a priority trying to help the people love each other. Because what will keep you coming back, what will make you want to be involved, I think, is that you realize that love's at work there. Because love simply is beautiful. Right? There's a reason why people were so attracted to Jesus in the Gospels, because his very being radiated beauty. And I think a community that learns to love each other and to, to welcome you know, visitors or strangers, there's something inherently beautiful about that. And so while, yeah, it matters about the forms that different churches can adopt to express their, their witness— the fundamental thing is that you are helping the people who come to this church become better lovers of each other. Uh, and when you can do that, you can screw up in lots of other areas and it's going to be okay, you know? And I think that's a really profound insight. 
Yeah, and the, it I think it helps us, especially if we're trying to grasp the connection in the text between uh, fall and redemption. Um, if you have this recognition of formation, like you don't opt into getting formed, you are always already being formed. And when right. we show up on uh, in a planet, on a family, and a, in a his, point in history, and if, all these things, there's tons of 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 history and inertia of being formed in a life denying ways. Um, and then to say how in that narrative where the, the source is actually wanting love to become flesh in relation to this, do you understand redemption? It makes like, you you know, if you, if we're like, Hey, you've never read the book now, what do you think happens? And they're going to say, yeah, well, I'm going to guess like redemption's connected to, like the transformation of all the ways in which yeah. love's denied. Uh, yeah. And you're like, yeah, duh, makes sense. Good story. But it's, that's not normally how we tell it, you know? Yeah. So um, how, how does the, your, do you see the retelling of the story, paying attention to the depth of a very basic telling of Christian, the, the, the story of Christianity get to a new heart um, when it goes to formation in love and redemption? Well, I think sometimes it'll start with persons, first of all, recognizing that they thought they knew what love was, but then when they come to a place where Christ's love is active, they may be shocked, Mm -hmm. right? They may be surprised because we, first of all, tend to have loves that are fairly narrow, right? They're focused in the worst scenario, just on ourselves. And then sometimes the love expands to include a few other privileged others, family members, a few close friends, perhaps. But then what has to happen is that the love has to expand and grow and extend its reach to all kinds of people, to all kinds of places and communities, and sometimes even to the places and the people that we don't want to associate with, either because they're dangerous, they're violent, they're ugly, they're whatever. And so I think that the transformation that can happen is first of all something that's modeled to people as different from what they currently understand and feel. And when that begins and you realize, wow, I had no idea this is what love is about, then you start to say, I want to be a part of this. And then you take this gradual process of trying to figure out, well, where was I thinking wrongly? Where was I behaving in ways that are inappropriate? And as you come alongside other people, they can tell you, look, this is where we want to be heading. This is where we have always screwed up in the past. You know, try to be honest with our histories and say, look, we're not perfect. But as you then bring people together in a kind of apprenticeship program rather than a straightforward like teaching or even worse indoctrination program, uh, then you've got a lot more opportunity for the formation that we want to have to really take hold in the lives of people. And that means that the life of churches has to become more economic, more practical, and not sort of ethereal, spiritual. Right, So that people, uh, because they become friends with each other, because they decide that they're going to actually come alongside each other, they're in a position where they know, oh, this person needs this help. I can provide that help. So I'm going to be with them. and I'm going to work through this issue. Or you know, we want to try to reach out to this part of the community that's got some needs. So we actually go and be with them, right? It's this more apprenticeship idea, which I think is the key one for churches to recover. Because then the love doesn't stay on the level of abstraction, but it actually goes to the level of where people say, I've got X or Y skill. Let me put it to use. Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, kind of came to mind in in that section, and I think especially for Protestants, it's hard always to put their mind around, is that... Uh, American evangelicalism re- helped us reread the Great Commission as somehow going everywhere around the world and getting people to assent to applying the correct Christological title to Jesus for salvation um, when it really has about making a community of disciples that can then be uh, an, a, an embassy of God's reconciliation um, mm-hmm. wherever they are, right. uh, learning to practice that reconciliation with each other, but also for their community. And 
the, like there how how do you see that desire in Protestants to keep the salvific event being God and God's alone um like, why well, we can affirm that but it also sometimes is received in a if your gospel telling's a gnostic one as essentially being left off the hook for real discipleship and personal transformation yeah yeah I, you know that, that's a complex question and i don't have just one answer to it i think one of them has to talk about how the desire to evangelize can be one or another form of imperialism where you're counting souls to you can say have now entered our fold and different denominations compete with each other for these individual souls. And yeah, it becomes just another way of making your house bigger, right? Or in the more traditional imperial sense, expanding your territory or something like that. I don't know that a lot of folks still do that, but I know there's still some of that going on and that's really problematic. But if you're not thinking about evangelism in terms of expanding your territory or growing your count of individual souls and you're really thinking in terms of trying to model and let loose the kinds of love that Christianity encourages, then discipleship is at the heart of it, right? The whole point of going to somebody to try to witness to God is to witness to and unleash the love that God has made available to us. Mm -hmm. And so that then immediately puts you in a position where it's not just about going and talking to people. It's about going to wherever you're going and trying to be a beloved community together. And that means, you know, serious commitment. It means it's not about numbers. It's about the quality of relationships you're trying to build. It's about commitment to stay with folks so that as, thing, as soon as things get tough, you don't just run away. I mean, it's sort of doing what I describe with the monks of Tiberine in Algeria, right? Brother Luke, who is this doctor, he's in Algeria. He knows it's a really dangerous place to be because Christians are on the, the radar screen for terrorist groups who want to kill him. But he says, look, I'm, I'm here to share God's love. And I'm not going to leave just because it's gotten scary. I have woven my life into the life of these communities and I can't leave them because to run away when things get difficult isn't a way to bear witness to the lack of love rather than the desire to love. And so, you know, he's, I think, a really good example of of what evangelism can look like uh, if you're thinking about witnessing to God's love. It means taking the skills that you have, the abilities you have, and just giving them to the community and mm-hmm. becoming part of that community. So as someone who wasn't a a, a native, either not just to America, but to the South, um, how would you describe this kind of deeper understanding of redemption and community and formation uh, challenging the latent white supremacy that exists in the South? Because I, I know uh, I haven't, um, I mean, I'm from North Carolina. I'm, I, I feel like I'm like permanently in recovery from just that formation, right? Like it, you could have done anti-racism training. You could have, uh, worked hard and hard, but that formation just exists in Southerners. Mm -hmm. And part of like that definition of the, 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 the way you tell the fall part is creating the conditions for genuine transformation because it's not something that's like solved. It's something that has been formed into you. And now you're trying to create new patterns of formation and community. Yeah. But in the South, the church is still such a segregated place and the, uh, and, and in North Carolina in particular, between the Moral Monday and Black Lives Matter movements, it it has brought to the surface what's been latent all along. Yeah. Um, well, and I think the, the Trump phenomenon is just revealing this in spades now because he's – but it's not just in the South, interestingly, right? It's, it's the kind of, of xenophobia and the kind of racism and the kind of – anti-Semitism. I mean, there's just so much fear that's operating in the imaginations of people. And the 
the particular character of the fear may vary from different regions, right? And we know that depending on where you are, the fear of black people is still huge. I remember not so long ago, oh, I can't remember his name now, the pastor who used to be, a, oh, Jim Forbes. Mm-hmm. James Forbes, he came and gave a sermon and he said that um, what he thought is happening, and he's also from North Carolina, is that whites are terrified of blacks because they're afraid that if blacks get power, they will do to whites what whites did to blacks. Right? That's really powerful. But it, it shows you how this fear then becomes a motivation to make sure that black people don't get power. Now, what you said earlier, I think is important, right? Segregation. There's still so much segregation that's happening. And if what we're talking about makes any sense at all, it is to say that love can't stand segregation. Because as long as you stay segregated, you don't ever have to get to know the people who are other than you. And so you can't ever begin to really address the fear that you have. You can't really begin to appreciate how the suspicions you have of others can be so wrong. And it's only as you come alongside others, commit to being with them, learning from them about who they are so as to break down the kinds of stereotypes that we may have about them. It's only as that sort of very practical, economic, coming alongside each other happens, that the fear that motivates so much of this awful stuff that's happening in America right now, it's only then, I think, that some of this fear can dissipate because you can't love in a context of fear, right? The gospel even says love drives out fear. So if you've got fear, you can bet pretty much that the fear has driven out love. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a, one of the things that, uh, it, so if, if times like this bring things to the surface, so you at least have an opportunity to be honest about, uh, the reality. So hopefully we can begin as the body of Christ to form each other in different ways and, uh, and, and hopefully form our children and grandchildren, uh, mm-hmm. in, in ways that don't include some of the distortion of love, insecurity, and fear that drives um, our uh, us apart from each other, these divisions. Um, th- like the other kind of plaguing uh, wound has to do with our relationship to the planet. And that one is seems to me, under what circumstances would you have a moment or an event that forces you to stare at it, right? Like if a, a heart attack inspires uh, um, cardiovascular exercise or the sheer vulgarity of Donald Trump inspires all sorts of, of uh, responses or, or, or killings inspire taking down flags and these type of things. Yeah. I, I'm worried that the time in which we'll do what we already know we really need to do will be when large numbers of members of the church in, in the rest of the world, the global South, have had huge devastating effects to their lives, well-being, and death. Um, and that moment will be one, at the same time we're called to move towards redemption, we also are going to have an existential crisis as people of privilege about our own well-being, power, and place in the world. And I... Like, yeah. I, as someone who's thought about that, like I, that's just trips fear. I, I, it's not a thought through one. It's just a general overall worry. And I wonder what do we do, telling yeah. the story deeper, knowing what the uh, ecological trajectory of the planet is. Yeah, that's that's a really big, big and hard question. And I don't know that I've got a really great, simple answer to it. I think one way to begin to address it in our particular, say, North American context, is to come to terms with the fact that we're mostly ignorant about the world in which we live, right? That's a feature of urbanization. It's a feature of modern technological forms where the people who have experiences of the world are having them mostly brokered through screens, right? Mm -hmm. Computer screens, TV screens, phone screens, 
That's what we think the world is, what we see on a screen. And of course, that's ridiculous. We have so little direct, intimate, practical encounter with the non-human world, with land, with other creatures. And as a result, we're dealing with major deficits. We don't know how to relate to these things. We don't even understand what they are. And so I'm a big proponent of getting people involved in in activities that help them reconnect with non-human creation. Because one of the things that has happened as a result of industrialization and urbanization is that people have lost a felt attachment and a kind of kinship to non-human creation. And here I've learned a lot from indigenous peoples who will say things like, imagine growing up in a home where you never felt your parents loved you. You're going to spend so much of your life compensating for that feeling that you've not been loved. And then they'll say, many of the sort of Western industrialized people of the modern world, they grow up in a world where they do not believe that the land loves them. And so they not only feel that they have to compensate for this lack of love, they have to then also deal with the fact that they think this world is not their home, or they have to deal with all the guilt that they think they are producing by doing destructive things to the earth. And so she, she, he, I mean, various authors I've read have said, nothing can be more important than for people to have the kinds of engagements with land, plants, animals, in which they can experience the love that's operating there again. Because once that healing, just within our own imaginations, can start to take hold, we might start thinking differently about our economies. Now, I know that sounds really nebulous, but it's profound when it happens. So, for instance, when you get people who've not ever grown a plant and you get them to grow a plant, sometimes they fail right away by killing it. You know, it didn't get watered or blight came along or whatever. But once you get people involved in getting their hands in the dirt, taking care of a plant, And then seeing that plant produce fruit or a vegetable, you now have a different set of sympathies. You have a different kind of imagination. It's it's not going to be a huge transformation necessarily, but it's enough to start working with. And I think, yeah, we could wait for the big cataclysm that's going to finally wake us up to our destructiveness to the land. Yeah, that might happen. But I also think, Along the way, what we have to be doing is preparing people to sense that this world is a place where the land itself can be an expression of love to us. And that what we're really supposed to be doing is joining our love with the love that's operative in the land, in other creatures. And when that healing starts to happen, we just don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, I know that in some of your other works, you've engaged these questions at a more kind of philosophical uh, level, um, mm-hmm. and and this is a, a an aside and or connected, but I'm interested in what you think. Um, in kind of envisioning uh, anthropology in continental philosophy, so much of it has been shaped by Heidegger um, right. that the when a human being on occasion lapses into authenticity uh it, it's almost as a, a a protest of this individual against their embeddedness against their historicity against their materiality against their day-to-day role in their family and culture and place like those moments of authenticity are like when you're being detached and un, like seizing yourself and things. And I, I, I feel like like in hearing this indigenous reply, it's going now let's imagine you develop postmodernity and not using Heidegger's existentialist anthropology. Like the, let's just assume that to be human, like everything you think is, it, 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 it 
it's, it's, there's a certain shift there that um, is begging us to reconsider how we understand human beings. Right. Um, and and I want, I, I'm just interested in your thoughts, like thinking through it ecologically, our connection to nature. Um, where would you, where would you kind of point to begin developing a more, uh, holistic or, uh, or account of yeah. the human being? Well, I, you know, it's interesting that you bring up Heidegger and I know you don't want me to talk about Heidegger, but I want to just, Oh no, I'm totally you. cool talking about Heidegger. I just, yeah. I let's, didn't want to derail before the hope happened, but yeah, let's just th- stick with him for just a second because he's a, he's a complicated case here, right? So mm-hmm. when you talk about how authenticity means a kind of departure from the culture in which we live, there's reasons for that because he's concerned about industrialism. He's concerned about how technology has formed people to be in the world in ways that are really not in the world, right? right? They, they end up having the effect of separating us from each other. They have the effect of reducing the kind of awe and reverence before things that have the effect of eliminating anything like the sacred dimension in the world. And I think in that respect, Heidegger's pretty accurate. I mean, he's, he's hitting on something very important about how the very forms of modern urban technological life mitigate against something like um, a deep encounter with the strangeness of things. And I think that's valuable because it's a kind of critique of culture that we still have to work on, that we have to develop. We don't have to necessarily do all the moves that Heidegger does, but I think we need to heed him on that. Um, so I think that's that's not a bad bad place to start when talking about anthropology. I think I would want to have in our minds, first of all, the the realization that we think we know who we are, but in fact we don't. Human beings, life itself, is much more mysterious than we've made out to be. And so what I want us to do is to start thinking about basic kinds of relationships and attachments and entanglements that we have so that we have a much richer sense of how the human being does not make sense apart from the life of all other kinds of creatures, starting with microorganisms in our gut that make possible our very being, right? Most of our body is not even us. It's other microbes, right? Well, that changes then the very meaning of the human being because it's not just that we are self-standing beings who then can relate to things as we want on a voluntaristic basis. We are in our bodies always sites of hospitality, needing the hospitality of others, but also needing to provide hospitality to others. So this sort of uh, dialectical way of talking about hospitality opens us up to our dependencies, to our need, to the strangeness of our lives with others, and also the terror of our lives with others. Because if you think about something as basic as eating, for me to eat, others have to die. That's just the way it is. Well, then you have to ask this really profound question, which is how do we make ourselves worthy of consuming the life of another creature? That's huge. And now you then open up a whole new set of questions, which instead of focusing on human autonomy, where we ask, what can I do with my life? We start instead with a very different kind of question, which is, to whom do I owe my life? And when you ask that question, all sorts of other questions can emerge. Mm -hmm. Well, and and even that question, I think, means uh, like... The, uh, the structural ontological place of the self is not the individual in relationship to its own finitude, but uh, the, the self in community and yeah. uh, in connections. And the uh, the enlightenment's kind of narrowing of the horizon for truth, meaning, purpose, and value to the individual. Um, and the kind of dualism we created between the mechanistic world of n- nature to be utilized to efficiently, yeah. of course, to our uh, meet our needs and the kind of human exception as the one with subjectivity and mind and things like yeah. I, I, I like I love the image of like even you as a person are 
like your life includes being hospitable. Um, right. and you return the favor, uh, when you, when you croak to the very same microbes. Oh well, uh, yeah. Right. I mean, that's important that you be able to talk about something like death in that way as a kind of returning the favor. You know, Francis of Assisi got it, but people thought he was crazy. Well, saints tend to do that. I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, I can't remember who said it. I don't, I, I was reading a, a, a book on, um, on, uh, and was talking about, it was using kind of the process of s- someone becoming a saint to kind of point out like, it, 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 someone becomes a saint not because necessarily of what they did or anything, uh, but over time when people go like, "What does God look like?" They keep referring back to this person who, in their own time, they, everyone thought was a bit crazy and yeah. uh, was doing these rather like radical things, or uh, was content in ways that were just attractive to people, or was hospitable and different and that kind of thing. Um, and, and so, with someone becoming a saint is the is the uh, church uh, recognizing where intense fidelity had happened in the past yeah and or you know not just intense fidelity but intense love right because one of the things that i don't think we appreciate enough about saints is that what makes them saints is not just that they're faithful to god but that they are the kinds of people who through their ascetic disciplines learn to get themselves out of the way right sort of eliminate ego so that they become something like windows to what God's love really looks like if it becomes operative in people. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Well, And they function as, I mean, it's similar to the way you tell the narratives in the text, but they function as, like, uh, as evidence of what um, formed souls look like. Uh, There are these these real embodied people who can pray while doing dishes or wash uh, wounds of people or stand in front of an army, or know yeah. the name of every person on their block. Like, right. it, it, all those things become uh, uh, not, like, they are the exception, but they're the, the call of uh, formation. Yeah. Uh, so so you, you end in hope, which is always good. Um, it would be real depressing if it's like creation, <laughs> fall, redemption, and eternal conscious torment. <laughs> right. Um, so, so how how do you retell uh, the image of hope? Maybe use the creation or First Corinthians fifteen image, uh, yeah. and in this or in the communal uh, uh, cosmic imagery uh, in in Paul. Um, what's what's the uh, hope uh, reconsidered um, in the light of of uh, love? Well, I think the way I, I want to frame it. Because it's really hard to talk about heaven, right? We don't know what heaven really is, but we get some clues, I think. And it starts with the resurrection of Jesus. And that's important because it's an indication that the hope that we have is not a hope in some ethereal, spiritualized reality. It's a hope that is embodied. That means it involves the whole of creation Every material body now matters and is wrapped up in what God most desires for eternity. Okay, that's important because it changes the way we live right now. Because if you start with the idea that hope means getting away from everything, we're going to treat everything quite differently than if we believe hope means redeeming everything. Because now if it means redeeming everything, we've got stuff to do with everything, right? We have to start taking care of bodies, especially if we believe Revelation, which says that God's going to live with creatures forever. Uh, So that's a big thing. The other one is ascension. And again, that's a doctrine that has often been really embarrassing to Christians because they think, what does it mean? You know, God, Jesus ascends to God in his body. Why would that be said? Well, again, I think this is another way of reiterating the importance of how Heaven is not closed to bodies. Heaven is only closed to sin, to distorted love. Because heaven, I think, in the most succinct formulation, is simply the time and the place when God's love is fully active. Nothing but God's love is active. And the biblical phrase for that is it's the time when God's love is all in all. Right. So then you have to try to do the imaginative work of trying to figure out what would it look like 
if everything about my life, everything about your life, everything about the life of plants and trees and animals and other people, what if everybody was animated only by that love? That would be what heaven is. And we know that this love is powerful and we believe it will succeed in the end because it was first demonstrated for us in the life of Jesus. Okay, He, he is put to death in a violent, hostile world and the hatred and the violence doesn't win. Love does. And what the love does is it shows, A, that God never abandons bodies, but then B, it shows that the bodies that God loves are bodies that God is going to heal, that God is going to put on a path toward complete, beautiful, 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 beautiful flourish. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, 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 I think it's important. I think it's important. All of a sudden, I'm hearing, sudden myself, I'm echo. hearing myself echo. Cool. There's two of you, man. There's like a three second delay. That's really weird. Um, the uh, um, the one of the things that that I I, I think would be helpful is um, it, it, some people could be reading the book and then you get to those texts and their immediate problems and the way you encounter and relate to them is like you aren't like you you just aren't answering their enlightenment questions on how to interpret eschatology or ascension or the resurrection yeah. um and yet you're emphasizing the embodiedness side of things um and then like if you go and read all the different resurrection narratives the the clarity on what the embodiedness looks like is is, is not the easiest thing to figure out right but the church canonized a whole bunch of different ways of narrating it so, yeah. like how as someone who's retelling the narrative of scripture uh, do you understand the the narration of the inbreaking of new creation hermeneutically yeah i mean this is obviously a book where i couldn't do everything right so i wanted to get to the bare bones and try to state as clearly and compellingly what it means to talk about Christianity if the heart really is love and that's what's supposed to sort of shape everything else that's being talked about in Christianity. So your question about how are enlightenment people going to respond to this? Well, what I want to say is, first of all, why do you think an enlightenment hermeneutic is the way to read scripture in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you recognize how it's precisely this hermeneutic that has done so much damage so why are we wedded to the Enlightenment conception of the human being as a self-standing, rational, free, sovereign subject? Because that's not what the Bible presents to us about people. The Bible gives us a picture of persons as much more social beings than they are individual beings, much more driven by what the organ that the Hebrew scriptures talk about as the heart, and they don't mean just the stuff that, you know, the organ that pumps your blood. They mean your animating core, right? Your affections, those are the things that we need to be talking about rather than just some sort of reason, especially as it gets developed by say, the empiricist tradition or even the rationalist position. I mean, those kinds of ways of construing what a person is, the way they talk about human agency, the way they talk about the character of the world is basically one big storehouse of natural resources. All of these ways of speaking that are very near and dear to modern or postmodern people has been a disaster. So I think what you got to do with people like that is first help them see that the hermeneutic that is guiding their way of interpreting the world, interpreting scripture is already in some pretty significant ways, a departure from what we might describe as a more biblically informed way of thinking about persons and agency, but also that it's just not very true to the world as we experience it. Um, what we've learned about enlightenment forms of rationality is that they have made it possible for human beings to impose themselves upon the world rather than be the ones who live within the world in the modes of care and fatality. And when you start to unpack some of that with people, 
my hope is that they'll see that the enlightenment tradition that they've wedded themselves to is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I just know like in writing a book that is clearly for a general audience, I, I, when I did a book tour around my recent, the Christology book, it was like that I had to answer these questions. I would have given a talk. They would, Oh, I really liked what you said about this, but insert, please just tell me my enlightenment question. And, yeah. and in to say things like the question is just not even asked in a theological way or yeah. to frame the eschatological rupture of new creation under those terms is to deny it any depth right. that the scriptures are insisting are there. Or right. like, you know, there's so many different ways. They just look yeah. at you like, so you just don't even really believe in the resurrection? You're like, no, no, that's like the opposite <laughs> of that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. So, so I, I feel like the um, one of the challenges of the church is just how uh, how how Gnostic our hermeneutics are, and the type of formation we need is. Like not just rereading the the attending to the story, but also attending to the actual way we read the story. Oh yeah, because no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, we gotta we gotta figure out how our imaginations have been held captive by cultural forms that are deeply antithetical to what we're trying to do. For sure. Well, in your Duke, so you you have E. P. Sanders around. If it took. If it took till the 20th century for Christians to rediscover Jesus was Jewish and maybe what Palestinian Jews were doing should impact uh, your articulation. I'm losing you, man. I don't know what's happened here. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I missed that whole last question. It sort of came in in pieces. Oh, I was just saying uh, about the kind of hermeneutical impact that if it takes until the 20th century for E.P. Sanders to tell everyone – Hey, you know, we might understand Paul and Jesus a bit more if we remember they're Palestinian Jews. Like in the yeah. first, like the, the, like if you just pause for a minute and catch the sheer volume of theology that was written unattentive to the Jewishness of Jesus, then why would we not think that there are still immediately obvious fatal flaws to what's going on in our interpretation and that yeah. the real questions to be asked are ones, um, that basically have Hume's definition of a miracle as just the inerrancy, the inerrancy test. Yeah. Um, that is a, uh, I think a significant challenge and um, it changes the way we see education and formation uh, in the church. Right. No, I think you should just go on and preach it, man, because you're, you're right on to something. And, you know, another variation on this, it's not just sort of the enlightenment model, but, it's also like uh, the American uh, sort of patriotic move that happens in so much Christianity. I think that's been something that's been so striking to me as someone who moved to the United States is to see how in many churches, and I, I can't speak to all of them and I can't speak to all different regions, but what I've learned is that so many churches have this notion that the aims of Christianity and the aims of America overlap so much of the time and so when they read scripture they read it as a pro-american text and so whatever the the goals of american life are the american dream that's what the goal of christian life is and so to try to break through that and to say look you you need to stop this patriotic hermeneutic because it's it's screwing up the way you're thinking about health and flourishing about salvation and you know, all of the things that motivate human activity, uh, if we're not attending to the fact that the Gospels or the Pauline letters or whatever, when they talk about how the Christian life is something like a death to the ego and that it's about raising to new life with Jesus or it's about Christ living in us so that the life we live is no longer our own or that we no longer see things from a human or insert American point of view, but we see things now in Christ. And when we see things in Christ, we see new creation, right? All of these strategies that we've had to undermine these ways of talking about how the Christian life 
is not to be identified with the goals of America. That's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm constantly running into this when I go to different churches, is that as soon as you start to say things that sound un-American or anti-neoliberal free market worldview, you've lost them because their allegiances often are much more to the patriotic hermeneutic than it would be to anything like a biblical hermeneutic. Yeah, I, 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 you talk about the way um, idolatry functions in, in the book. Uh, yeah. It, it, but, but you know, after this, I keep thinking you could have a whole a, a whole parallel version of it, um, it, where it's just like the way of destruction, and you, yeah. you run it straight like the Didache <laughs> in the early church. There are two ways. There's the way that leads to life, and this is the way of love, and, and then there's the other one. And yeah. uh, this is how you Americans tell it: creation. You discovered a world. Thank you. It's new. Um, and uh, there, okay, there may have been people here before, but now there we got, we save the heathens. You're welcome. And uh, we purchased the land and a deal, and and they got cold, gave them blankets, moved them out. But you know, creation have nothing. It's great. Like, and in the whole creation of America story begins by just denying everything that ever came before it. Right. Um, you do the same thing. Um, it's like the moment African Americans become a whole person and not three fifths. That's their creation point. And then we want to just deny how that history or anything would affect things. The fall, depending on if you're in the south, I already know what the fall is. Um, but if you're in the north, it's probably a different one. And then if you go out west, they they have it out here. Their way they tell the American story is very, very different. Right. Um, but the, the fall is so connected to the ideology of what pure Americanism is. And there's kind of two or three versions but yeah. redemption is usually around a political figure, and it could be JFK or it could be Ronald Reagan or whatever. But right. um, like you're like, this is the moment we're finally, you know, here, and and everyone has their ideology is the true hope of America, um, and the only thing they all share in common is that God is invested in blessing our nation every time they talk. Yeah. Um, it, it, and it, what's odd is I imagine if you straight face told it, that, yeah. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. This Duke professor. So this is good, good biblical. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, and I can, I can just imagine, I can even hear Rush Limbaugh talking this way, right? Because I've, I've heard pastors say that when they, when, when people in their churches think about their lives, Rush Limbaugh is really the one who's shaping the imagination or the Rush Limbaugh equivalent. It's a cultural figure. It's not Christ. And so I think churches have a lot of work to do to figure out how do you talk about forming people in the way of love when they're being formed in their culture in dramatically different ways. That's a really, really tough one uh, that you need to attend to, I think. And, and you brought it up early in uh, in the conversation about the that Christianity is not a... Uh, Socratic religion, um, and, and I think it does. There's a sense that kind of Kierkegaard's kind of critique of Denmark uh, and thing is something that fits here um, more than we would, we we're really willing to recognize. Yeah. Um, because in a sense, the culture dominant religion has uh, always been super market friendly, nationalistic, uh, and we've just slowly incorporated more people that are connected to Abraham. Um, right. but, but that's just because our, our, our theology never really mattered to begin with. Um, or our theology was unrelated to our faith. It was more our commitment to economism or something like that. And I, I, the Kierkegaard's response I find helpful and I don't know, but it, it still has this very individualistic side to it, but his kind of insistence, on the the offense and um the 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 journey of being a christian involves like giving yourself to something right like when socrates succeeds you don't owe socrates anything mm -hmm. because he's a teacher and that's what teachers do but when well, he's you a midwife yeah and yeah. when you know jesus is the christ you owe him everything yeah. And and yet I don't think uh I don't know. I feel like that 
that that is something we have to be challenged by, but it's not, it's so easy to hear it and then not know that it's connecting to these competing ideologies that are just rampant in the church. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you may be right that there's going to be the need for us to talk much more about the offense of Christianity. But I think if, if love is your primary sort of category now by which you retell what Christianity is and why it still is in our culture, you can't just stop at it. What you're, you end up having to do is in presenting Christianity, really show that the culture is the offense. Because the culture is the, the, the sort of hermeneutic, is it's the power that is actually degrading your life. And so Jesus, in a way, then, has to be presented as the one who reveals the offensiveness of the culture that we are in. And I think that then becomes a way to say, oh, it's not just that Jesus calls into question who we are, but that Jesus gives us the way to call into question where we are in such a way that we now see that what we thought was a good is actually a real big harm. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, that that a preach, Norman. I am. Um, I like it. I like it. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, do you have any other any um, yeah. any any uh, closing thoughts, questions? Well, I mean, I you know, I don't have any sort of big pronouncements. I mean, I, I'm hopeful that that people will look at the book and and see that that things have been presented in a way that are fresh. You know, not just tired and boring in ways that they've heard maybe too many times. I'm hoping that people who have written off Christianity, because there are plenty of folks who are in that camp, who think that if you're a Christian, you've lost your mind and you should be checked into a hospital or something, that they'll look at this and they'll say, oh, this this is actually not just interesting, but compelling, right? If we really do believe that Christianity is something like a school for training in love, uh, my hope is that Christians who maybe are bored with Christianity will discover there's something really good going on and non-Christians will say it's worth giving this a look. Uh, if, if those two things can happen, I'll be really pleased. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, hop on the internet and, and hang out. All right. Well, thanks so much for talking with me, Trip. This podcast is sponsored by Phillips Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a theological school that offers Christian education in service of intelligent, just, and compassionate religious and civic communities. They welcome students to a safe space for truth-seeking conversation about the Bible, Jesus, and faithful living. They have on-campus and distance learning options. Go check them out at www.wherefaithleads.com.